I just to go to go to Wall Street. Um, I have a question. Uh, wouldn't it be wise to talk in their language and talk about money um, instead about environmental quality and biodiversity? Um, what do you expect that uh, their reply will be on this story? Well, needless to say, I won't be um, giving precisely the same talk. And biodiversity is actually the hardest uh, in, in many ways. With business audiences, they know about energy already. Um, it's, you know, it's huge. The resources are all priced. Um, and the externality has been being debated now for 20 years. And um, one assumes they're taking long-term bets as to how long it'll be, if ever, um, before regulators decide to move on the externality. So, you know, you've, they've got a, a regulatory risk issue in front of them, and, and they, can, they can price that to some extent. Um, similarly with water, where that's becoming scarce, uh, that one, again, that's, it's expensive, the infrastructure is expensive, the energy needed to move the stuff around, depending on how you're doing, it's expensive. So they can put those two um, together. The human health one, um, which I didn't mention, um, the human health one uh, is, is really tricky because you have this artifact, if you're using the statistical values of life, that, um, you know, the... <laughs> You can't come up with inter-country comparisons. But, I mean, what we're positing is 3.6 million premature deaths a year from uh, fine particulate and from ground-level ozone, up from a million today. Now, you know, what's another, what's another 3 million sort of thing uh, in the world of 9 billion? But, actually, in developed and advanced economies, and the US is allegedly one of these, <laughs> uh, very very definitely advanced in terms of being concerned about health, uh, our, our experience, my experience, has been that health always matters much, much more. The higher income, the more uh, the, you have the worried well syndrome, the more you have people extremely concerned. Uh, so on that one, when you can point to rising premature mortality in the richest societies in the world, uh, you've, again, got something which isn't going to go away. Biodiversity is the hardest of them, um, I find. Um, the best one I've, I can produce, I mean, there's, you've got the fisheries examples, and, and where the fisheries have disappeared, you can put a number on you know, what it's done to jobs, what it's done to the local economy. Uh, or in a country like mine, which is, and it's not a perfect system, but they've, 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 we've had tradable quotas now for 25 years or so, uh, the, the relative health of the fishery is actually understood. The cost of it having disappeared completely is, is appreciated. The, the, the best one I, I find I, is, is, is talking about pollination services. Uh, even people on Wall Street understand the fact that you know, the commodities which are traded um, in the agricultural scene uh, do need uh, bees uh, with whom they don't have a contract. Uh, <laughs> and th that's, but it, it's a much, much harder one because when you start trying to talk about resilience, ecosystem resilience, the fact, and then they, and then they say, well, how much, because you see, I showed you that slide, you know, mean species abundance dropping you know, by about 10%. You say 10% to someone. You know, 10%, that's the sort of number you use, well, I get 10% better fuel efficiency if I buy that car, or I get 10% off that yogurt if I buy that brand, and we lose 10%, but, you know, it, it's just, it, it's not helpful. And trying to talk about, okay, well, there may be tipping points here, that, that we've got all of this over-engineering in nature, uh, we don't quite know where the resilience starts to break down, and, you know, that's much, much harder. So I've got to be honest with you <coughs> and say that, and when I'm thinking of e ecosystem services here and, and biodiversity in the sense of the diversity of living things, in that sort of rather narrow sense, that's, I think that's a harder one. But um, let me tell you that, that um, we're taking the Wall Street thing seriously. We've invited as guest speaker to the ministerial dinner at the end of next week, uh, not an environmentalist, but we've invited um, a big-time investment advisor, and that's Jeremy Grantham. And Jeremy is going to talk uh, about, uh, in his terms, the crisis of capitalism and the fact that it simply can't get any of this stuff right and watch it because the scarcity of that stuff, once you've destroyed it, will overwhelm you. So uh, we, we, we are, we're doing quite a lot there. 
um, to, to, to reach out to that community. But you're right, it's, it's money talks, and as Pavan said, this is absolutely true, until, somebody said, until the, the crisis is imminent, until you know it's there, uh, you'll, you'll keep on gambling to, to the end. There's always going to be one person standing. That's the thing with fishery stocks. The marvellous thing is that as the stock keeps collapsing, the, as long as you're the last in the business, you know, you can survive up to a point. Uh, and so the real issue is the extent to which governments are prepared to step in and augment the price signals by adding these other ones that we don't have at present. Uh, and that is a, that's a slow job, but obviously the team exercise is one of the things which is going to make that more plausible and enable governments to do that in a more credible way. Thank you. That was a long answer, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have two short lines for you. Um, when you're there with, uh, with um, the investment bankers and commercial bankers, your first message should be, listen to your clients. They are getting it. Listen to Coca-Cola, listen to Walmart, listen to which have a, not all of them, but listen to your clients, and I think they will, that will resonate with them, particularly now. The second one is, this is creeping insolvency. This is creeping insolvency. And you may, you may tell an anecdote, which I sometimes use, and, and, and I think it will resonate with my friends in, in New York. When is, crises are of all times. So the question is, after this crisis, when is the next crisis going to be? And what is the manifestation of that crisis? Now, if you go to the history of crisis, it always happens on a Monday. And they know that. Because in the weekend, we're trying to resolve the issue, whether it's in political, in a summit, or in the, in the, in the banking sector, or in the business sector. It is often in September and October. All the black days are during the week in September or October. And with a certain biblical logic, it's seven years later. So you can fix the date in Wall Street. The next manifestation of the crisis will be Monday, 12 October 2015. Now this, make the note, but this goes, to the, this goes to the heart of the deep study. Because what will manifest itself on that Monday, 12 October 2015? And it is so obvious. We are exceeding the planetary boundaries. Malta said already in the 19th century, three billion people. Well, we have been able to live with seven billion people. We are exceeding our planetary boundaries. And who are the ones who are suffering from that? All those small holders who are at the beginning of our supply chains. And on Monday the 12th, October 2015, they will say, listen, we are not selling to you anymore. What's happening on Monday the 12th, October 2015 is comparable with 17 October 1973, which by the way was a Wednesday, unfortunately. <laughs> because the fundamental balance is changing. The poor people will not, although they are <coughs> the world, the poor people will not accept that they don't get the fair share of the supply chain. And the clients of your attendees and the investors, they will listen to you, listen to your clients, because they are at the beginning of the supply chain. There was a very interesting statistics of Puma. Only 8% of their revenue is gener of, the, of, of, of their income is generated by themselves. 92% is third, fourth tier suppliers, very much deep in the supply chain. Those are, those are the ones who are part of our supply chain and their supply chain. Remember, remember the date, Monday 12 October 2015. It'll be Marx, it'll be Maltus, and it'll be Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> What a bleak perspective. Would anyone have another question after this? Salman. Hi, Salman Hussain. Um, this is actually 200 people here. I'm doing, making this remark just for Simon because he's not going to be here tomorrow. Um, I'm giving a plenary tomorrow, which is based on PBL's work and looking at specific interventions and to answer the question that we, have, we are doing the analysis, we have done the analysis and show very significant regionally specific benefits in monetary terms in terms of improving, in terms of, for instance, RED, in terms of agricultural knowledge, science, technology, I think it's very, very important to kind of take that message across. And specifically, actually, we see the OECD benefits. Um, so you're taking a very kind of selfish perspective on this. The OECD benefits markedly from these various interventions that we've been looking at based on the PBL study. So that kind of work is being done, which we can discuss. Yeah, thank you. Are there further 
questions from your side or comments or 